What's up, my miners of intelligence and consciousness? I'm Rick Brooks, and this is Rick's Mind. Enjoy part two of Kyle Topper's interview. What's up, Kyle? How are you, buddy? Yeah, I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing? Dude, living the dream, man. Did you have a good weekend? It's pretty boring, to be honest. I mean, without wanting to, to say too many details, and, and you know, I, I have to watch a bit what I say, I guess, is um, there's, well, I'll start off with last week, there was a decision in England where for the first time a serious judicial sentence was handed down uh, to an, an Extinction Rebellion activist, and that activist happened to be James Brown, who was a Paralympian um, for England um, a few decades ago. And he, what he did was he had climbed onto the top of a plane and glued himself to a plane. Um, and I know that's a pretty extreme action to take, but it, it fulfilled all of his purposes. You know, it got mainstream national news. A lot of people came out in support of him, um, even from, from the side of politics that you wouldn't expect that to happen. And then this week was his judgment and he got given, I think a 12 month custodial sentence without parole, um, or so it might be six months without parole and 12 months um, sentencing. And so that kind of you know, swung home a bit of the reality that, you know, 12 months is a, is a serious part of your life um, to, to lose. I think he's got daughters that are in their teens, late teens, maybe early 20s, um, so that he's going to be missing, you know, serious time with his family at, at a crucial part of their development. And um, then we've also got other people inside scientists rebellion that have taken action in the past and and are looking at maybe not 12 months but significant amount of time spent behind bars as well um i don't know how much of this is coming across to you guys but there's a group called the insulate britain who are um currently causing a lot of headlines in the uk for blocking highways and and they're looking at serious potentially six months or, or more and unlimited fines is the new condition that the government can impose on them so they can repossess property and houses and stuff you know that it's not small fines that could be serious so a lot of those kind of things you know it's it's one thing to sort of think about the consequences of your actions for on a personal level before you you do it but it's another thing when you're standing in front of a judge i haven't personally been in this position yet but i can't even imagine the emotional um you know strength it would take to to, to stand up in defiance of that and keep doing what you what these people are doing um so that, that's something i wanted to touch on is is, is you know that it's not an easy emotional turmoil. Another one, sorry, just quickly, is um, there was a, a guy in the, in the US um, that was a lawyer who basically won a massive court case for um, a group of, indi of Indigenous people in the northern part of, I can't remember exactly which country in South America. He was um, representing them um, as an environmental lawyer and he won the case. And in, that was the case would, would mean massive fines for Chevron, um, for some horrible activities that they did, which poisoned the, the drinking water and, and some of the local environment for some groups of, of people in, as I said, northern South America. And he, through a technicality, um, and it's totally unheard of, even in um, all, all case law, as I understand from having just read media reports, he's been given six months, um, I think, supervised detention. So I think he's at home, but I might be wrong on that. But nevertheless, it was just a technicality of that, you know, I think Chevron wanted to subpoena his laptop because, and, and that would have meant that all of his client lists, all of his, you know, um, uh, professional details and, and client network would have been exposed to Chevron who are uh, not the kind of company you want that to happen to and would have potentially endangered some of his clients in that part of Northern South America, I assume, was his reasoning behind not wanting to make his laptop available. The judge has just given him a six month sentence. And I think the judge had ties or if she didn't have ties, she she was somehow involved with Chevron directly. And, She's and probably on the, yeah, yeah, we have the same thing that goes on here. We have um, Supreme Court justices that work for Monsanto and stuff like that. So that's that's not that's par for the course, man, all over the world. One of the things that, you know, while we're doing a part two is there's a lot of heavy technical information in yeah. the first podcast that we did. And I think that it's paramount to kind of take a step back. And like one of the things that DeMarco and I kind of discussed off of, off of the first shows, when you say like two degrees to the, to the average person, that doesn't necessarily resonate. Like 
I feel like sometimes with this movement, and this is why I wanted to bring you back, is we need to get very, like, I guess more of an overarching, like, what does that, like, one of the questions I wanted to really ask you was, what does that mean? Like, and I mean, I know you want to give a scientific answer because that's how your brain is trained and that makes sense to you and your peers. Yeah. But to, to the average person, what does two degrees mean? Like, and I feel like, when if you're trying to sell a product or you're trying to to get people involved especially with this right there needs to be a certain element of fear so like i guess what i'm trying to ask is like in your opinion your professional opinion like what does two degrees mean i mean demarco and i discuss this that means more wildfires right like what is something that is a- applicable to to people like i know that means rising sea level so i want what i want you to do is I want you to scare the hell out of us. We're going to go full bummer for a little bit, but I want you to scare the hell out of us about the next 15 to 20 years could potentially look like if we don't get this under control. Um, it's important. I, I will do that, and we're going to get to that. Just very firstly, I want to say that it's important with this, what you mentioned about fear messaging, it's important to... All of the psychological analysis tells us that people are motivated not just by fear. Fear is a is a high motivator, but you need to lay out an action plan of where people can concretely say, "Okay, um, that th- that's the worst case scenario. That's what we're heading forwards. It sounds horrible. What is what fundamental steps can I take straight away in order to av- avoid that?" And what we've always heard for the last sort of you know fifteen, twenty, twenty five, thirty years of um, I call it the neoliberal paradigm as the, the sort of the understanding of our economy and our society that we've had for a long time now in, in Western countries is that that can be done on a personal level, you know, uh, less plastic, uh, less flying, um, less meat, less uh, energy use, turn off your lights when you're at home. Those things are all good um, and I'm not denying that, but it can't, the, the sort of change we need to happen needs to be made at a systematic level because these are systematic problems that we have. Now, mm-hmm. in answer to your question, so so I, I'm going to give you the fear messaging, but also that that needs to be directed into concrete steps. How can I improve my life? And that is not going to happen on a, on a personal level. That is going to happen on a level where we change the system we're working in. We can explore that a bit more. But um, to answer directly to your question, I'm going to quote from a paper that came out uh, a few months ago. Actually, this was an article relating to the paper because it lays it out a bit more clearly. So what the next 15 to 20 years could look like or even sooner, climate change could lead to wars as global food shortages and more frequent heat waves fuel political instability and mass migration. So what we're actually talking about is not polar bears and not whales and um, not even the fires that you mentioned. It's more about the, the resources that we need for a good, happy, healthy and safe existence becoming more and more strained as um, the, the resources that we have get more and more used and are depleted and are less strong because of climate change. Now, um, the the really scary part is here that crop yields could fall by 30% by 2050 because of a trebling in land affected by severe drought. So you think of all, like, I think there's four crops that support more than 60 or 70% of our calorific intake across the world. Maize, corn, wheat, and rice are responsible for, for, the, for the majority of the food that, that everyday people need. Those crops are going to fall. It's already locked in stone, even if we stopped emitting today right now. Those crops are going to drop by somewhere between 10 to 30%, and this paper is suggesting up to 30% by 2050. There would be almost a 50% chance of two or more of the top four four corn-producing countries, that is Argentina, Brazil, China, and the US, simultaneously losing 10% of their normal crop in one year in the 2040s. So you think if all of those four countries suddenly had a 10% drop, I know that doesn't sound like much, but it multiplies. It's it's an effect that that increases the problem everywhere else by a factor of, you know, 10, or it's a magnitude effect. It's not just 10% worse. It It's 10% on top of that other 10%. So you're looking at, we call this a multi breadbasket failure where there's several major areas that produce a lot of the world's food suddenly all have um, problems with delivery and supply 
leading to food shortages. Now, we look in the history books, what happens when you get food shortages? You can look at, at the worst case events, things like uh, what happened in Russia in the, in the middle of the 1910s, in 1914, 15, 16, 17, leading to a full-blown revolution, leading to, you know, a systematic regime change which was beyond comprehensively evil. The same thing happened during the, the Great, Great Depression. These are the kind of effects that happen when there is uh, a reduction in available goods and services that people need. Now, yeah, go on. I want to kind of pause you right there because I definitely think that's going to happen. But what I, if I was going to take a crack at this, I would guess that this probably wouldn't affect the countries that you just list, listed, right? I think that this would affect other countries. So I think that this would that would include a lot of the mass migration. I think that our our, our food prices would rise, which is something that we are seeing right now. I think that we're, we're right now we're seeing a lot of inflation on an economic level. I think that that would even would go up more in the next 10 to 15 years. Like, yeah. I mean, it already is happening, but I don't know if that would necessarily affect the countries that you're listed. Like, I think it would have, I think, I think, I mean, I'm just totally spitballing here, but I feel like it's yeah. just going to affect people that are of like in the in the third world that we're giving aid to, which is terrible because that also doesn't give like these main countries like a real reason to care, which is very scary, right? And I mean, if we're talking about mass migration, I, I know that right now we have a massive incident on our border in, oh boy, I think Del Rio, Texas. We have a lot of people from Haiti that are migrating into the United States. I'm not sure if that's an environmental issue. I think, I believe it could be because of the earthquakes and all the other, okay, go ahead to Barco. Thank I, you. I, yeah. <clears throat> I'm not sure a hundred percent if it's all environmental, but it is because of not, it's because of the Haitian earthquakes, not recently, like the big ones that happened like 10 years ago. Um, I think we spoke about this. It is Del Rio, Texas. I think we talked about it maybe in the last show that it, it was basically, they had asylum in Mexico and Mexico is just done with them. So they just are just kicking them out and sending them here. And we, we don't want to do anything with them. Yeah, we're, I mean, um, it's, it's happening. Yeah. yeah. If I could just quickly respond to that. Absolutely. Um, I, I understand that point of view and it's important to re remember we're not talking about sort of a historical context or or a context that we can even really um, get a reference for. So the the world is now so connected on so many levels that it, that nothing that happens in one particular part really stays there. Um, if it, if we're talking about an international destabilization event, now um, we saw this in two thousand and. Uh, the period up to 2015 after the global financial crisis where food prices rose to such an extent that it, it caused the Arab Spring almost directly. I mean, there were other factors at play as well, um, but it caused the Arab Spring, which saw destabilization and led to regime changes and um, up to, I think, 5 million immigrants just from Syria alone, which brought about um, changes in, in the EU. So, we saw Viktor Orban in in Hungary is a is a far right wing nut job dictator came to power. We saw in Poland suddenly the regime f switched way to the far right. The um, the far right party here in Germany went from like almost no recognition to to having you know almost a quarter of the votes or, or up to twenty percent of the votes. And you saw out of that coming as well. I, I Obviously, there's a whole other set of issues that came to play, but someone like a Trump came out of that whole situation as well, and Bolsonaro. So these events are not just staying in, in one part of the world as we would previously have thought they might. So I, I don't think that point of view holds up to the to the situation that we're looking at. And this evidence here is saying that up to 700 million people a year could be exposed to droughts uh, at lasting at least six months by 2040. This is double the global historic annual average. Um, so if we could continue with that um, point about what, what, what does the world look like at two degrees, you mentioned fire. At 1.9 degrees, 50% of the Earth's surface will have between 100 and 1,000 times more chance of fire in the next, uh, under a 1.9 degree scenario. So um, you're, you're talking about 
you know, the difference between that we've already seen from, say, the, the baseline average amount of fire that was happening in Australia, in North America, in Canada, in um, parts of Europe and Asia and Siberia, I, I need to mention there, would, would multiply again. And the events that we think of now as being horrible with these fires, and they are, and they release an enormous amount of emissions as well, might I add, and reduce the, the strength of the biosphere and, and the ability of its function is going to increase by another ma um, magnitude. So um, fire becomes a much worse danger. It, it, and every 0 0.1 of a degree beyond that, so that's what the, the difference between 1.5 and, 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 and 2 degrees, those in between that, you've got all these, you know, 0 0.1 extra is 1.6, 1.7 is a lot worse than 1.6, 1.8 is a lot worse than 1.7. So there's there's no target level where we can say okay we've gone over 1.5 let's worry about getting to two it's okay now we've got to worry about 1.6 and it it gets exponentially worse. Um, then we're talking about by by that point at two degrees more than 400 million people could by then live in areas where it is too hot to work outside. Okay, the number of deaths caused by heat waves could increase to 10 million a year in the 2030s. At the moment it's it's about 300,000 so it's tripling. Um, cascading climate impacts will probably cause higher mortality rates, drive political instability, that's the, the project I was talking about, and greater national insecurity and fuel and regional and international conflict. So the, it's pretty clear from the research at least that we are talking about a bunch of things that will play into each other and won't stay in one area or, or outside of the, the wealthier countries the way we might have thought they would have in the past. Wow. Would, that would be my my answer to that question that that issue. That's a that's a perfect answer. That's that that make. It might, I mean, the two degrees made sense, but it's good to have. Like I had no idea. Like, you know, everyone always thinks of the polar ice caps melting and whatnot, and and like that makes a lot more sense when you're talking about food shortages. You're talking about more wildfires, right? Like. I definitely think that I think that the messaging that has been going on in this movement and and, and I'm just going to lump everyone that is like on the especially scientists that are environmentally conscious that are trying working to get this solved right. It's definitely working. And and the the scariest thing is, is a, a personal example right. My parents, lifelong Oregonians, they have noticed in their lifetime how things have changed like we when they were kids um there's a place called the dalles the columbia river gorge used to get snow all the time used to have every winter ponds would freeze over people that never happens anymore um we would get like at our house in um this little town called colton it would snow every year every single year and now it barely happens it's at the foothills of the cascades and we don't get snow every year. We'd get, you know, six, seven inches of uh, of, of snow on the, on the regular around Christmas. That doesn't happen now. And so a lot of the older generations are starting to notice, like, the, the planet is definitely warming. Things are changing, right? And we, we discussed the cyclicality of it. And you were very, you're very, because that's one of the questions I wanted to bring up. That's an argument, a counter argument. And you're like, no, no, no that's right. But we should be in a cooling pattern at the moment from the, our last conversation and we're not we're warming we should be getting co colder um and then if you and i mean that even makes sense from a historical standpoint if you look at some of the um let's say the viking settlements in greenland like it was a much warmer climate when they got there they were able to farm and stuff and then 20 30 years it was too cold and a lot of them died a lot of the settlements died and, and whatnot um but we're not seeing that um this is a random, and we're talking about like systematic, you know, large systematic changes. I'm, I'm, is there any any positive benefits that are going to come from the planet warming? I mean, are we going to have to colonize Antarctica? What's going on there? <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, just, I'm spitballing here. Um, just to jump on that point you were making about what your grandparents and parents have experienced from and, and expect from sort of the background uh, functioning of the environment. One very 
easy way to, to make this point and get it across to a lot of people is called the windshield test. So if you take a drive through the country in your car and say you drive for an hour, in the, I remember this even in the late 90s and the very early 2000s in Australia, if you were driving along the road, and this, this has been proven across most continents, if you're driving along the road for an hour, in the late, late 90s, and it would have been crazier back in the 60s, 70s, but late 90s and early 2000s, you would have to stop after an hour or an hour and a half and wipe your windscreen because there were so many dead insects on the, on the thing. Do you guys remember this? We're now looking at you can drive... Uh, uh, certainly where I've driven, you can drive two, three, four hours and not have to worry about the windshield getting any insects on it, even days long, you know. Um, so that's one very obvious way that we've changed. And some studies have shown that something like 80% of the insect biomass in your, in the main parts of Europe has vanished since the 70s and 80s. Um, you're talking about a massive death of insects. I've spoken to an insect uh, expert about this, and that's not really directly to do with climate change. That's more coming from um, some of the products they're using and the land management strategies we've got in agriculture. We don't have enough um, uh, protective areas where insects do have a breeding ground that is, that is free from pesticides, free from fertilizers, free from any other forms of contact with humans and with uh um, our products. Now, um, to move on to your, your question was more broadly about um, where did you want to go me to go with the answer? Oh, anywhere you want to go, man. Anywhere yeah. you want to go. Um, yeah, I just asked if we're going to have to colonize us or Antarctica. Right, right. I know, that, I know that one of the best places, and this is something to, uh, being more conspiratorial minded and for fun. Yeah. One of the best places to live when shit hits the fan, which it seems like it's trending that way, is New Zealand. So a lot of the ultra-rich yeah. are buying yeah. property and homes in New Zealand at the That's moment. True. That's um, true. And it's like, I've been, I don't know why I pay attention. I just, I, I don't know, I love conspiracy theories. But I do, I like, uh, I've been watching this. A lot of people that are v the ultra-wealthy are buying Homes, property, you know, assets, something to tie them to the New Zealand just in case shit hits the fan. And I was yeah. like, I know that. And it's because that's closer to, I believe, yeah, a little bit closer to Antarctica. Right. And, and I don't know. Like, we've got, I mean, I, I've always wondered. Antarctica is an interesting thing, just being a weirdo, right? Like, that to me, that seems like the, the strangest place. It's where all these nations that don't get along some of them don't get along, have formed a pact to not mess with it, to keep it perfect. There's no wars. There's no nothing there. Like If we can't get along in everyday life with policy and shit, like how the fuck were we able to get that type of stuff done there? That's always, I've never understood that. I've always been like, what is going on in Antarctica? Like that, That's something that I've always wondered about. I was like, why... Like how how are we able to solve like be like God oh, we're gonna do this we're gonna protect this place and it's gonna be great and you can't live there but I just feel like that's bullshit I don't know that's, um, that's my opinion I th I think the very obvious answer is in fact that there's no resources there so um, a very similar project is in the Arctic where you theoretically should also have a very uh, strongly protected natural area. But you've got competing interests because there is a lot of resources there. We're talking about minerals. We're talking about fossil fuel extraction possibilities. And we're talking about shipping routes and fishing, fishing areas. None of those things are available in Antarctica. It seems to me, I could be wrong, and I'm happy to listen to other theories as well. Yours is interesting. But the fact that um, no one is competing over it seems to be the main point there. In terms – so where in, in the Arctic it is the case – um, that there are resources to fight over. Um, in terms of the New Zealand point, that is interesting, absolutely. I think the one of the other areas that people in the sort of wealthier classes are, are trying to get property and, and get the hell out of um, out of the way when Armageddon might happen, whatever that looks like, is Chile and, and the south of Argentina. Is uh, You've got a reasonably uh, good rainfall pattern. You've got a um, reasonably amenable climate. Um, it does tend to be quite stormy and quite cold in the middle of winter, but 
uh, at the same time, it's sort of right out of the way. You've got a mountain range just directly north, which would offer some sort of protection. I don't know. That does seem to be another place that, that the wealthier classes are buying land. Uh, and Tasmania is another one. Um, what? Well, sir, do tell more because that's right in our price range. We definitely can afford a little bungalow in Argentina or, <laughs> in Argentina or Tasmania. Well, this I, is delightful. I think the New Zealand option might be better because, uh, I mean, I... I've got nothing against South America. It seems like a really interesting place and I would love to visit, but Argentina doesn't have a particularly stable set of governance structures, historically speaking. So, um, I mean, we have seen revolutions and, and so on there, whereas in New Zealand, it's been relatively uh, peaceful for a long time. John, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add, <clears throat> there's also a hell of a lot of Nazis in Argentina now. Dude, and, I was going to yeah. bring I was going to bring that point It's funny. Up, there's know? a lot of Italians there because my, uh, my great-grandfather was a glassblower from Italy, and he, he ran away from home as a kid to come to the United States. He wanted to go. He actually went and lived in Argentina, and he wanted to because there was a bigger Italian population there. So it's like, it's all like... Native people, like Italians, and then, yeah, Nazis since World War, especially in Patagonia towards the mountains because they all think it's like Berchtesgarten. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, um, one, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Kyle. Well, I, I just wanted to really quickly tie together my, my point about the insects, and, and um, it was this, that we're not, we're not just facing a climate crisis. This is something that I think a lot of people are not that clued up on. Um, is we've also got a biodiversity crisis, which a lot of experts are actually more worried about. So uh, the biodiversity crisis is, in plain English, the fact that our ecosystems are now so damaged. We're looking, I think a recent paper said there were only 3% of the Earth's surface is covered by ecosystems that are what you could be con what could be considered uh, perfectly intact. And um, what that boils down to is something like 60% um, of the biomass of all animals on, on land are animals which humans use as livestock to eat. And then another 36% of all the biomass of land dwelling animals is humans. That leaves only three to 4% of the entire biomass of the land uh, living animals is wild animals. So we have effectively completely dominated the biosphere with human uh, needs. Does that make sense? So that's why we're, I, I'm almost more worried about the biodiversity crisis, which doesn't get as much attention, where climate change is only one of the factors um, that is playing a role. It's not even the main one. The main one is that we're taking um, huge tracts of land. You look at Brazil, the Amazon getting chopped down has an effect on the climate, yes, but even more scarily, we're losing a very intact ecosystem. I think tropical rainforests have lost, you know, in the 60%, 70% of their entire area in the last um, 20 to 30 years because of Western consumer-driven demand. Um, and we're looking at, a, at, a, at what scientists call ecosystem collapse. In Australia, 18 of the 19 different ecosystems categorized. So, you know, you look at coral reefs, you look at um, fishing ecosystems, you look at um, bush ecosystems, um, mountainous, et cetera, et cetera. 18 of the 19 are on the verge of collapse, according but to... Is, but isn't that, I mean, with Australia in particular, isn't that kind of a, a special circumstance because they have so many um, invasive species there. Like I was just, I got sucked down a rabbit hole not too long ago and I read about the wild camels of Australia. Like they're fucking wild camels that are thriving there and they have to call them every now and again. And they're trying to figure out like how to make them economically viable, right? Like be because it's one of the only places where there was wild, they have wild, I think it's called a, wild cattle but there's there's a name i want to call them brush bulls or something of that of that nature right like that you can go and hunt they have cats they have that have just decimated uh, birds and stuff so that's a weird weird like scenario what's going on in australia like there's just right. not a lot of large predators but i do want i do uh, that's 100 percent true i mean I, I read a lot of books and one of the books I just read was this, this book called Undaunted Courage. And it was about Mary, my, Lewis and Clark, right, and their expedition for Mayweather Lewis um, and Clark heading from the east to west, right? They were the base, 
first people to to get out to the the Pacific Ocean in uh, the United States in the mid 1700s, right? So when they were going across the Great Plains, they would talk about millions of buffalo, and then on the yeah. peripheries of these massive herds, there would be deer and elk, and it was just like a plentiful, plent like they they would they had they was a self sustaining expedition and they would just murk all these animals like no problems hunting or anything and as someone that does hunt it's just fascinating to read about like what it used to be like when they're at fort clats if they killed 97 elk that year to get them through the winter and that had no impact so it's like in the rivers f- full of salmon they've got they're meeting these friendly tribes that are you know living off the land like it was totally available um and that doesn't happen anymore right like we 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 kind of fucked that up here We're, we've brought in a lot of the we brought in the buffalo back from the brink but like we've done some pretty shitty things right and 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 when i'm reading about that i can only imagine what it would have been like in other parts of the world uh, anecdotally to add to that i mean there's count like like, like stories about how people they would take sightseeing train trips uh, during like the the kind of like old west period where rich people would ride on trains through the old west as they built the railroads and they'd literally just sit out the windows with their guns out the windows and just pick off buffalo as they go and not even not even do anything with them and like it's disgusting how people have destroyed everything we didn't we didn't understand conservation conservationism is a, is a it's kind of an american concept right like it's one i think roosevelt teddy was the first one's like oh bro we got to do something to like not get rid of all these these large game animals that make america awesome but yeah i mean i de- that's something that, that's definitely real like if you don't believe that you're an idiot like that you can literally pick up a book from someone and read a first hand account of the way it used to be in the united states i'm sure there's stuff like that um in africa if you even some of the documentaries you read about oh boy the hazid i don't know this tribe in africa their their poop uh, has a, a bunch of uh, I don't know. Just look up magical poop. It'll pull up the, the tribe. Um, <laughs> I'm serious. <Okay. laughs> I do not okay. know. I know that, but but um, um, they use their uh, self-sustaining uh, tribe, and they can't find the game that they used to hunt. To like, it's not there. They're, they're, they've been reduced to just eating baboons. I think it's a Hazid or something like that. I don't know. Uh, it's the here it is, the Hadza. Had to, oh, also, yeah. dude. Well, I mentioned magical poo. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to read a little bit about. Yeah, that. I'm going to. This is this is intriguing. Yeah, no, they they their their biome, their gut biome is it fucking bulletproof, man. And scientists will collect their poo and be like, they'll probably like. There's the, no joke. You can get a poo transplant. Like that is a fucking real thing. I didn't know about that until like five years ago, and it, it blew my mind. Anyways, he's pulling that up while he's searching for the magical poo to make sure that I'm not lying. We can continue on. I'm sorry. I'm you are. Sorry. You are indeed not lying. You're. You're right. Like, yeah, I found an NPR article about them. It's their oh, their gut biome it. is made up of, or their entire diet is made up of whatever they forage in their local forest, and it just adds like incredible like immunity. Hell yeah. Kyle's, Kyle's writing this down. He's going to get some magical poo. <laughs> it's real expensive. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I, I'm not an expert on, on human fecal matter, unfortunately, or the process of transplanting that into people's guts. But what I can tell you is going quickly back to your other point is it, um, I've got two good examples. So when the Romans first got to North Africa, we're talking about Algeria, Morocco, that really northern part um, where the, uh, the Atlas Mountains are, Um, When the Romans first arrived there two and a half thousand years ago, um, what they found was an absolutely unparalleled, amazing forest. The whole mountains were just covered in these enormous trees. We don't actually have any surviving specimens. Um, There is literally nothing left. There there are a handful of small pockets of forest still left in those mountains um, of of large uh, trees and species. But there are species that we, we, we may never find again. Um, and back then you used to have, you know, enormous bears, um, you used to have tigers and, and all the, the, the animals that we think of and, and imagine with the central and s- southern parts of Africa were all there in abundance, even more so. And what, what did the Romans do? They cut down all the trees to make uh, timber and, and, and so on. And then just in destroying that ecosystem, that wasn't enough for them. They started 
when when the empire started to become a bit fragile, one of the em- emperors decided that it was a good idea to bring all the animals to to Rome one by one to fight the gladiators. And you would you would talk about like there's literally um, articles written where there were hundreds of animals slaughtered every day by these gladiators in sport in the big sport arenas in the Colosseum. The, but the Colosseum was only one of a number of amphitheaters, as I understand it. So. Um, in long story short, that that was an amazing, enormous ecosystem, which, by the way, used to feed um, and, and used to have amazing wheat belts, which were much bigger than than what we talk about today in the in the central part of the United States. Um, there used to be an enormous amount of agriculture happening in that part of the world, which is not possible anymore. That so that's another good example of what you're talking about. And then my final one is in Scotland. We think of these rolling hills that we have today with with barely any trees on them. You know these beautiful grass fields with the, with the sheep just sort of chill in the in the paddocks. Um, when when civilized humans began to populate that part of the world, uh, there used to also be hugely intact, large forests, healthy healthy ecosystems, full of amazing animals and and huge trees as well. And um, what happened was obviously they were cutting down the trees. But more than that, that ecos so in in North Africa that ecosystem is a different kettle of fish. It will not just rebound the way that uh, it would in Scotland if there were no sheep and grazing animals. The problem is especially sheep and goats like to eat the small seedling trees. So as soon as any trees start to sprout, which could grow one day to being big enough that the sheep couldn't eat them anymore, they would form a forest. But they never get the break in 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 respite that they need to grow to a size big enough to support an ecosystem. And the reason that there's so many sheep is obviously humans. And there's other grazing animals as well, which are native. Um, but in the past, you, you had a number of different species of animals that were predators. So that would, um, one of the main ones is the lynx, the, you know, the big cat. Mm-hmm. Um, which is still in a lot of parts of Central Europe. They are here in Germany, for example. They are here in Poland and, and towards Russia, but they are not any anymore in Scotland. And they would have preyed on the sheep, and so they, that was one reason they were got rid of. Another one is obviously the wolf, and another one is um, there used to be bears in Scotland um, up until you know when civilization came to, came to the northern part of Scotland. So that's another example of of the way that we're that we've been doing this for, for thousands of years now since the agricultural revolution is just decimating whole areas of ecosystems. And at some point that is just going to, to fall apart, not in a way that we can comprehend, but in a possibly a global um, chain effect, so to speak. We call that a cascade collapse. Yep. I feel like I have to, as a proud Oregon State University graduate, I have to mention beavers. Uh, I anecdotally to, to talk about Scotland, I just read recently within the last month in Scotland, Scotland used to have a very like huge population of beavers, but in the, I believe it was the 1700s or the, uh, the 1600s, they were hunted to extinction in Scotland for their fur, just like they were like really stressed here. Um, there's been a resurgence of beavers because in the 1980s there was a like a, a nature reserve that someone had set up where they had introduced uh, a breeding pair of I believe North American beavers to kind of start repopulating Scotland with beavers and over time some have escaped from the nature res- preserve or whatever and they would take them and they would take them and reintroduce them into somewhere in England where they never were extinct and are still part of the ecosystem but there's a kind of this like battle brewing in Scotland right now with farmers and um uh, and ranchers with uh natural activists who are trying to just let the beavers repopulate but I mean, shocker, they're, the beavers are damming streams and they're flooding fields and everything, which is beavers, this is one thing I learned, I used to be a um, fish and game major for a minute in it, at Oregon State. Beavers are a keystone species. They are like the, the keystone of the environment cannot have, like you can't have a forest if you don't have a beaver because the beaver will dam a stream, create a create a a small pond animals will come to the pond to feed then the pond will dry up and it will become a very very nutritious wildland and then that's where your forest comes from correct we're i mean speaking of this we're we're gonna we're gonna have i didn't know this um but we, we started looking into scientific there's a there's another movement called extinction rebellion 
Uh, and we're going to have an expert on from Extinction Rebe Rebellion. Hopefully, they'll scare the hell out of us because uh, we're, we're, we lo I love animals. I mean, uh, just being someone that's really into to conservation and, and I love the outdoors. Um, I think the United States has done, we've done a lot of bad things, but we've also done a lot of good things. Public land and conserva national parks and like preserving a lot of our heritage uh, and wildlife. I think that we've done a damn good job at that. It's a weird system, but it seems to be working. And I know that like, um, I just, I'm hoping that the rest of the world will kind of look at the, the national park system and the BLM Bureau of land management and, and all of that land that we all, all of us own collectively. And, I'm hoping that you know that's getting done in, in the rainforest and stuff. Although I'm not super well read on that. Or Demar Hushay, don't we're not going there. But um, <laughs> as far as I understand, um, it's not considering they're actively chopping down yeah, the Amazon yeah. at an increasing rate. Yeah, that's that's disturbing. But but Kyle, like I think that you've done a great job of like shedding light on like how bad things are going to get if we don't change our way. And I think that, I think, I don't know if we're going to be able to do it. I think that when we get at, when it comes down to the, pre, the precipice of change, I think that we'll, we will be able to make that change. We have technologies that are being developed right now that will, that will make the transition smoother. I have a lot of hope in electric cars, but I mean, we got to end this bad boy on a positive note, brother. So, I mean, let us, can you speak to anything that's being done to actively better our circumstance? Yes, but before I do, I just want to touch off uh, my argument in, in general is, according to all the scientific research that I can see, um, is pointing to the fact that we are currently tracking the worst case scenario in yeah, almost right. every possible. <laughs> so just very quickly, so the, the cumulative amount of CO2 is accelerating that we've put into the atmosphere, okay? That's the same for the greenhouse gases. It's all accelerating. The amount of radiative forcing, so the amount of heat that's actually being captured and staying on the planet, is accelerating from 1900 with a big increase from the 60s. It's all tracking the worst case scenario. Now, in terms of the amount of heat being trapped in the ocean, that's accelerating on the worst case scenario. The acidification of the ocean, which is um, the, the ocean acidifies because there's excess CO2 being trapped into the ocean, and that has a chemist, chemical process that acidifies the ocean. The um, ocean is deoxygenating at the worst case scenario. The sea levels are rising, at accelerating on the worst case scenario. In the Arctic, the Arctic is heating um, at an abrupt level and on the worst case scenario. The melting ice in the glaciers, not just in Greenland and Antarctica, but also the, the global amount of glaciers is uh, accelerating with a mass loss um, and the Arctic sea ice has lost the most ice it's ever lost in the last 10 years. So Fuck. all of these factors are pointing that we're still on the worst case scenario. Sucks. And I don't, I don't see any reason to think that we won't keep following the worst case scenario in terms of the reaction of the planet to the amount of gases and um, human processes on the environment. The positives that I do want to mention though, is the, the idea of social tipping points. So we, you, you must understand the idea of a tipping point, right, where um, we, we talk about this a lot in the science, where um, until actually in the last sort of five, six years, they were, these were not that well dealt with by the scientific community. And arguably in the latest IPCC report, which we've leaked, they're still not being very well dealt with. But the idea is that you've got a number of ecosystems and, and biospheric atmospheric processes, right, that have a stable condition and then are quickly, not quickly, are, are flipped into an unstable way of working. What that means is if you push them to the edge of a table, say you've got a ball, right, and the ball is sitting on the table, if you push the ball a little bit in one direction, it doesn't fall off the table. It might be further away from you, but it's not off the table. You push it to the edge of the table and it only takes a small extra amount of force and suddenly you can't get it back on the table. You don't know how to. The process, the, the way the biosphere works is the same way. So we call that a tipping point and there are tipping points such as in the Amazon um, is now emitting more greenhouse gases than it is taking up through the growth of new plants 
and the ecosystem processes. The same is happening in the Arctic. As soon as we lose that Arctic sea ice, sea ice we will gain something like 0.4 degrees of temperature instantly or, or in a very short amount of time because the ice is no longer reflecting the sunlight. It mm. will be absorbing the heat into the blue ocean which is because white surfaces reflect more energy than blue surfaces. There are a number of other tipping points and they're being reformulated, re-researched, rediscovered all the time. But there are six or seven key processes. Um, Tim, Linton, Tim Lenton is the best researcher on this. Anyone can Google his name and find out uh, his latest bunch of research. But my positive message is there are also social tipping points. A social tipping point can also be negative. So a social tipping point I've already talked about in the Arab Spring, the uh, increase in pro prices of basic goods led to people uh, not being happy with the regime anymore and wanting a regime change led to a civil uh, disturbance event. But there are also positive uh, changes. So we've now come to a point, I think, possibly not quite yet, but we're at the precipice where it will turn into a positive tipping point that people are recognising that uh, the issues we're talking about are not about polar bears, not about whales, not even about the ecosystems we live in. They're about us. They're about our food. They're about our safety. They're about our drinking water. They're about our happy, healthy lives. Um, as you mentioned, with electric cars, um, that is now steaming full speed ahead. The price of renewables has now dropped way cheaper than, than it, it, it's now. The price of, let me be very clear on this, the price of renewables, wind and solar, to build a new set of infrastructure is now cheaper than to turn old coal-fired power stations off. That is according to the International Energy Agency. So we're now getting to a, a tipping point in that respect where it's now going to become cheaper and more profitable for the companies that they're going to turn their old coal, have to, they're going to have to turn their old coal-fired fired power stations off and build new renewables in their place because it's cheaper for them and better for everyone. Um, there are a number of these sort of things happening right now. The question is, can we make that process go fast enough, happen soon enough, with enough energy and momentum behind it from people like us that are concerned with these issues, that we drive the change needed in the amount of time that we're talking about before it becomes a process that we can no longer control, i.e. it tips to a, to a, to a, a process that we're not, no longer in charge of. Do you see what I mean? So there yep. will come a time when it doesn't matter, even if we stopped emitting right now, the collapse of, say, the amok, that's the, the way that the um, cold and warm, salty waters move around in the Arctic Ocean, that, for example, will slow down to the point that we can no longer control that. That will affect weather processes, meaning we can no longer stably and reliably grow food. For example, there will come a time that the Amazon will just begin to die off, and it's not too far away, it won't die off. It'll turn into a savanna landscape, not a rainforest landscape. See what I mean? So there are mm -hmm. these tipping points. There are biophysical tipping points, but there are also tipping points within our societies, and we're very close to a number of those, I think. The, the question is how do we drive that change and make, it, make the necessary changes? And that needs to happen according to the best scientific minds within the next three to five years. Three to four to five years. Well, dude... I appreciate all the work that you're doing. And I think that because of people like you and your dedication to the cause that we will hopefully get something done before it's too late, man. I appreciate you doing this. Thanks, definitely nice. going to have you. I'm definitely going to have you on again. Uh, the next environmental crisis or something that I'm going to get you on. We're going to get you wound up and we're going to, we're going to talk shop, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for educating us. Um, you know, I'm glad you brought it back because it got real fucking bleak for a second. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm glad you brought us back because I got dark. It was way darker than I thought it was going to get. But yeah, man, I appreciate That's it. That's what you asked for. I, gave I you what know, you man. I know. Sometimes I just, you know, I, <laughs> but I appreciate it, man. Thank but you so like, much. Like I said, though, that that is the thing. It's It's one thing to scare people, but then you've got to offer them a very concrete way to react. And the way I'm suggesting is that we need systematic change. And that does not come about without people on the streets forcing the government to listen, forcing people to take this issue seriously and listen to the scientists. That is the only way that we can make this change in the time we have. Thank you, guys. I really Thank appreciate it. So